The Russo-Japanese War, Part 2. Roots of the War. After the Meiji Restoration of 1868, the Meiji government enthusiastically assimilated Western ideas, technological advances, and ways of warfare. By the late 19th century, Japan had transformed itself into a modernized industrial state. The Japanese wanted to be recognized as equal with the Western powers. The Meiji Restoration intended to make Japan into a modernized state, but not a westernized one. Japan was not yet an imperialist power looking for overseas expansion. In the years from 1869 to 1873, the Conquer Korea argument had strongly divided the Japanese elite between the faction that wanted to conquer Korea immediately versus the other that wanted to wait until Japan was more modernized before invading Korea. No one in the Japanese elite accepted the idea that Koreans had a right to be independent. They simply wanted to slowly take over, playing the two main factions against each other. They supported the young men who formed the Korean reformist faction. The Japanese looked upon the backwardness of the Koreans, much like Europeans at the time looked at the backwardness of African and Asian nations. This became the reason that the Japanese should conquer the Koreans, and eventually the Chinese. Their inferiority gave the Japanese a right to conquer them, they thought. The Foreign Minister of Japan, Inoue Kaoru, gave a speech in 1887 saying, What we must do is to transform our empire and our people, make the empire like the countries of Europe, and our people like the peoples of Europe. He went on to say, that the Chinese and Koreans had essentially forfeited their right to be independent by not modernizing. Much of the pressure for an aggressive foreign policy came from below, with the advocates of people's rights movement calling for an elected parliament, also favoring an ultra-nationalist line that took it for granted that Japanese had the right to annex Korea and the People's Right Movement was led by those who favored invading Korea in the years between 1869 to 1873. Higher taxes on Japanese people in order to modernize Japan also led to the growing number of common people demanding something in return, like an overseas colony. It was said that the biggest misconception about Japan in the West was that the Japanese people were docile instruments of the elite. In reality, much of the pressure for Japan's wars from 1894 to 1941 came from the ordinary people. They demanded a tough foreign policy and tended to engage in riots and assassinations when foreign policy was seen as weak. The Meiji government refused to allow democracy, but they did agree to some of the demands of the People's Rights Movement by allowing an elected diet, which is similar to a parliament. In 1890, they had limited powers. The Meiji government also went along with the demands for a more aggressive policy towards Korea. In 1884, Japan had encouraged a coup in Korea by pro-Japanese reformists. This led to the conservative loyalist faction of Korea to call for help from the Chinese government. This led to a clash between Japanese and Chinese soldiers in Seoul. The Japanese government did not feel that they were ready for a war with China then. So the crisis was sorted out by the convention of Tientsin this left Korea even more strongly under the influence of China. It also gave Japan the right to intervene in Korea. All through the 1880s and 1890s, the government in Tokyo 
was regularly criticized for not being aggressive enough in Korea. Japanese historian Masao Maruyama wrote, Just as Japan was subject to pressure from the great powers, so she would apply pressure to still weaker countries. A clear case of transfer psychology. In this regard, it is significant that ever since the Meiji period demands for a tough foreign policy have come from the, pop, from the common people. That is, from those who are at the receiving end of the oppression at home. Russian Eastern Expansion Tsarist Russia, as a major imperial power, had ambitions in the East. By the 1890s, it had extended its realm across Central Asia to Afghanistan, absorbing local states in the process. The Russian Empire stretched from Poland in the west to the Kamchatka Peninsula in the east. With the construction of the Trans-Siberian Railway to the port of Vladivostok, Russia hoped to further expand in the region. The Tsushima incident of 1861 directly assaulted Japanese territory. Between the Meiji Restoration and World War I, the Empire of Japan fought in two major wars. The first one was the First Sino-Japanese War, fought in 1894 to 1895. That war was about control and influence over Korea, under the rule of the Joseon Dynasty. There was a strong competition for influence in Korea between China and Japan from the beginning of the 1880s. The Korean court was prone to factionalism and was divided with a reformist faction that was pro-Japanese and a more conservative faction that was supporting the corrupt Joseon dynasty and was pro-Chinese. In 1884, a pro-Japanese coup attempt was put down by Chinese troops, and a residency under General Yuan Shukai was established in Seoul. <coughs> a peasant rebellion led by the Tonghak religious movement led the Korean government to request the Qing dynasty to help them and send troops to help put down the rebellion. <coughs> the Japanese responded by loudly saying that this violated the convention of Tianxin. Then they sent their own troops to Busan and Incheon. They then seized Seoul and captured the Korean king and ministers. They then created a pro-Japanese government. The Qing Dynasty objected, of course. The war that resulted from this was only six months long, and the Japanese crushed the Beiyang army, as well as the Beiyang fleet, then considered the strongest fleet in Asia at the Battle of the Yalu River. Japanese forces captured all of Korea and the Laodong Peninsula, part of Manchuria, leading toward Beijing, Wei Highway, and Taiwan. The Treaty of Shimnoseki ceded Taiwan, Korea, and the Laodong Peninsula to Japan. The intervention of the Russian, German, and French governments after the peace treaty forced Japan to withdraw from the Laodong Peninsula. The Japanese government felt that they were not strong enough to be able to fight these European powers. So they gave in. Japan did not abandon their efforts to force Korea into Japanese control. On October 8, 1895, Queen Min of Korea, leader of the anti-Japanese, pro-Chinese faction in the Korean court, was assassinated by Japanese agents in the Korean palace. This backfired because it turned Korean public opinion against Japan. In early 1896, 
King Gojong of Korea fled to the Russian legation in Seoul. He believed that his life was in danger by Japanese agents. From then, Russian influence began to predominate. In the aftermath of the flight of the king, a popular uprising overthrew the pro-Japanese government and several cabinet ministers were lynched in the streets. In 1897, Russia occupied the Laodong Peninsula, built the Port Arthur Fortress, and based the Russian Pacific Fleet in the port. Russian acquisition of Port Arthur was mainly an anti-British move to counter the British occupation of Weihai Wei. In Japan, though, it was seen as an anti-Japanese move. Germany occupied Jiaozhou Bay, built the Tsingtao Fortress, and based the German East Asia Squadron in this port and made a brewery. Between 1897 and 1903, the Russians built the Chinese Eastern Railway, otherwise known as the CER, in Manchuria. The Chinese Eastern Railroad was owned jointly by the Russian and Chinese governments, but the company's management was entirely Russian. The line was built to the Russian gauge, which is wider than the gauge in other countries. Russian troops were stationed in Manchuria to protect rail traffic on the CER from bandit attacks. The headquarters of the CER company was located in the new Russian-built city of Harbin, the Moscow of the Orient. From 1897 onwards, Manchuria, while nominally part of the Great Qing Empire, was more and more a Russian province. In December 1897, a Russian fleet appeared off Port Arthur. After three months, in 1898, China and Russia negotiated a convention by which China leased Port Arthur to Russia. The Russians also got Taoyuan Wan and the surrounding waters. The two parties agreed that the convention could be extended as well. The Russians clearly expected extensions, as they immediately occupied the territory and fortified Port Arthur. This was their only warm water port on the Pacific coast, so it had great strategic value. A year later, they began, began to build a new railway from Harbin through Mukden to Port Arthur. This was called the South Manchurian Railroad. This railroad became a part of the reasons for resentment of the boxers that led to the Boxer Rebellion, when boxers burned the railway stations. The Russians also began to expand into Korea. By 1898, they had acquired mining and forestry concessions near the Yalu and Tumen rivers. This worried the Japanese even more and made the Japanese government decide to attack before the Russians completed the Trans-Siberian Railway. The Russians and the Japanese both contributed troops to the Eight Nation Alliance Army that was put together to fight in the Boxer Rebellion and relieve the international legations in Beijing in 1900. Here is an image representing the soldiers from the Eight Nations except Russia left to right. Britain, United States, Australia, India, Germany, France, Austria-Hungary, Italy, and Japan. The Australians were considered part of the British Army. 
Russia had already sent 177,000 soldiers to Manchuria, nominally to protect its railways under construction. The troops of the Qing Empire could do nothing against such a massive army, so they were kicked out of Manchuria. The Russian troops settled in, and even though they said that they would withdraw after the crisis, they made no plans to do that. Instead, they just made their positions in Manchuria stronger. A Japanese state statesman, Ito Hirobumi, started to negotiate with the Russians. He thought that Japan was too weak to kick the Russians out militarily. So he proposed giving Russia control over Manchuria in exchange for Japanese control of Northern Korea. There were five elder statesmen who led the politicians that made up the Meiji oligarchy. Ito Hirobumi and Count Inoue Kaoru were against war with Russia on financial grounds. Katsura Taro, Komura Jutaro, and Field Marshal Yamagata Aritomo wanted war. Meanwhile, Japan and Britain had signed the Anglo-Japanese Alliance in 1902. The British wanted to restrict naval competition by keeping the Russian Pacific seaports of Vladivostok and Port Arthur from their full use. The alliance meant that if any nation allied itself with Russia during any war with Japan, then Britain would enter the war on Japan's side. Russia could not expect any help from either Germany or France without having to fight the British as well. Japan, with this British alliance, felt free to go to war with Russia if necessary. The 1890s and 1900s marked the height of the Yellow Peril propaganda by the German government and the German Emperor Wilhelm II often wrote letters to his cousin Nicholas II of Russia praising him as the savior of the white race and urging Russia forward in Asia. From November 1894 onward, Wilhelm had been writing letters praising Nicholas as Europe's defender from the Yellow Peril. He assured the Tsar that God himself had chosen Russia to defend Europe from the alleged Asian threat. On November 1st, 1902, Wilhelm wrote to Nicholas that certain symptoms in the East seem to show that Japan is becoming a rather restless customer, and it is evident to every unbiased mind that Korea must and will be Russian. Wilhelm ended his letter with the warning that Japan and China would soon unite against Europe, writing 20 to 30 million Chinese supported by a half dozen Japanese divisions led by competent, intrepid Japanese officers full of hatred for Christianity. That is a vision of the future that cannot be contemplated without concern. And it is not impossible. On the contrary, it is the realization of the yellow peril, which I described a few years ago, and I was ridiculed by the majority of people for my graphic depiction of it. Your devoted friend and cousin, Willie, Admiral of the Atlantic. Wilhelm aggressively encouraged Russia's ambitions in Asia, as France, which was Russia's ally since 1894, was not so supportive of Russian expansionism in Asia. It was believed in Berlin that German support of Russia might break up 
the Franco-Russian alliance and lead to a new German-Russian alliance. The French Premier Maurice Rouvier publicly, publicly declared that the Franco-Russian alliance only applied to Europe, not Asia, and that France would remain neutral if Japan attacked Russia. The American President Theodore Roosevelt tried to mediate the Russian-Japanese dispute. He complained that Willem's Yellow Peril propaganda which strongly implied that Germany might go to war with Japan in support of Russia, encouraged Russian intransigence. On July 24, 1905, in a letter to the British diplomat Cecil Spring Rice, Roosevelt wrote that Wilhelm had partial responsibility for the war, as he had done all that he could to bring it about. He said, that Willem's constant warnings about the yellow peril had made the Russians uninterested in compromise, as Nicholas believed that Germany would intervene if Japan attacked. In fact, neither Wilhelm nor his Chancellor Prince Bernhard von Bülow had much interest in East Asia. Willem's letters were actually meant to upset the Franco-Russian alliance in Europe and lead to a Russian-German alliance. This was a big part of the Tirpitz plan and policy of Weltpolitik, meant to challenge Britain's position as the world's leading power. Since Britain was allied with Japan, then if Russia and Japan could be manipulated into going to war with each other, that this in turn would lead to Russia turning towards Germany. Willem believed that a Russian-German alliance would also keep Russia out of the Balkans. This would remove tension between Russia and Germany's ally, Austria-Hungary. During the war, Nicholas took the face value of Wilhelm's Yellow Peril speeches and hoped for a German intervention on his side. More than once, Nicholas chose to continue the war out of the belief that the Kaiser would come to his aid. By April 8, 1903, Russia was supposed to have completed its withdrawal of its forces in Manchuria that it had sent for the Boxer Rebellion. The day had passed. No reductions. In Japan, university students demonstrated against both Russia and their own government for not taking any action. On July 28, 1903, Kurino Shinichiro, the Japanese minister in St. Petersburg, was instructed to present his country's view opposing Russia's consolidation plans in Manchuria. On August 3rd, the Japanese minister handed in the following document to serve as the basis for further negotiations. Number one, mutual engagement to respect the independence and territorial integrity of the Chinese and Korean empires and to maintain the principle of equal opportunity for the commerce and industry of all nations in those countries. Two, Reciprocal recognition of Japan's predominating interests in Korea and Russia's special interests in railway enterprises in Manchuria and of the right of Japan to take in Korea and of Russia to take, to take in Manchuria such measures as may be necessary for the protection of the respective interests as above defined subject, however, to the provisions of Article 1 of this agreement. 3. Reciprocal undertaking on the part of Russia and Japan not to impede development of those industrial or commercial activities, respectively of Japan and Korea, 
and Russia in Manchuria, which are not inconsistent with the stipulations of Article 1 of this agreement. Additional engagement of, on the part of Russia not to impede the eventual extension of the Korean Railway into southern Manchuria so as to connect with the East China and the Shanghai Guam New, New Chuang lines. 4. Reciprocal engagement that, in case it is found necessary to send troops by Japan to Korea or by Russia to Manchuria for the purpose of either of protecting the interests mentioned in Article 2 of this agreement, that's the industries and railways, or if suppressing insurrection or disorder calculated to create international complications. The troops so sent are in no case to exceed the actual number required and are forthwith recalled as soon as their missions are accomplished. 5. Recognition on the part of Russia of the exclusive right of Japan to give advice and assistance in the interest of reform and good government in Korea, including necessary military assistance. 6. This agreement to supplant all previous arrangements between Japan and Russia respecting Korea. In response to the Japanese proposal on October 3rd, the Russian minister to Japan, Roman Rosen, presented to the Japanese government the Russian proposal as the basis of negotiations as follows. Number one. Mutual engagement to respect the independence and territorial integrity of the Korean Empire. Number two. Recognition by Russia of Japan's preponderating interests in Korea and of the right of Japan to give advice and assistance to Korea, tending to improve the civil administration of the empire without infringing the stipulations of Article 1. 3. Engagement on the part of Russia not to impede the commercial and industrial undertakings of Japan in Korea, nor to oppose any measures taken for the purpose of protecting them so long as such measures do not infringe the stipulations of Article 1. 4. Recognition of the right of Japan to send, for the same purpose, troops to Korea with the knowledge of Russia, but their number not to exceed that actually required, and with the engagement on the part of Japan to recall such troops as soon as the mission is accomplished. 5. Mutual engagement not to use any part of the territory of Korea for strategic purposes, nor to undertake on the coasts of Korea any military works capable of, men capable of menacing the freedom of navigation in the Straits of Korea. 6. Mutual engagement to consider that part of the territory of Korea lying to the north of the 38th parallel as a neutral zone into which neither of the contracting parties shall introduce troops. 7. Recognition by Japan of Manchuria and its littoral as in all respects outside her sphere of interest. This agreement to supplant all previous agreements between Russia and Japan respecting Korea. During the Russian-Japanese talks, the Japanese historian Hirono Yoshihiko noted that once negotiations commenced between Japan and Russia, Russia scaled back its demands and claims regarding Korea bit by bit, making a series of concessions that Japan regarded as serious compromises on Russia's part. The war might have been avoided had not the issues of Korea and Manchuria become linked. <laughs>
The Korean and Manchurian issues had become linked as the Prime Minister Katsura Taro de decided if war did come, that Japan was more likely to have the support of the United States and Great Britain if the war could be presented as a struggle for free trade against the highly protectionist Russian Empire, in which case Manchuria, which was the larger market than Korea, was more likely to engage Anglo-American sympathies. Throughout the war, a recurring theme of the Japanese propaganda was Japan was a civilized power that supported free trade and would implicitly allow foreign businesses into the resource-rich region of Manchuria versus Russia, the uncivilized power that was protectionist and wanted to keep the riches of Manchuria all to itself. Emperor Gojong of Korea came to believe that the issue dividing Japan and Russia was Manchuria and chose to pursue a policy of neutrality as the best way of preserving Korean independence as the crisis mounted. Hu Wide, Hu Wide, the Chinese minister in St. Petersburg, in a series of reports to Beijing, looked closely at whether a Russian or Japanese victory would be favorable to China and argued that the latter was preferable, as he maintained that a Japanese victory gave a better chance for Korea to regain sovereignty over Manchuria. <laughs>